Good afternoon, honorable members. As we in, in, uh, embark on the high level session with the <clears throat> Western Cape Provincial Legislature, after we have, we have uh, finalized the consultation process on the Women's Chapter Review uh, in, the, in the Western Cape Province. We will, we will immediately observe a moment of silence for prayer or meditation. Am I audible? Am I yeah, audible? Yes, yes, you are honorable deputy chairperson. So you hear me? Thank you. you I, it's just camera. that it's so quiet. It's just that it's so say. quiet. Did yes. you say? But the camera. Yes. <laughs> I think Is you there are... something wrong with my camera? You are too, yes. Can you see me now? Uh, for now, I don't. Hmm? Up, I don't know whether you, what is it that you can move to assist in order to be seen? Correct. No, it's so. fine, then I will. Am I not visible now? Um, you are visible, you are visible but Kevin, can you please assist, assist the deputy chair with the framing? I, I, I don't know why I don't hear you, Sebo. I will stop we my video. We can't see your forehead. We only see you to tilt to the eyes. I, I will stop my video so that it doesn't uh, disturb you. At least okay. all of you know my face, isn't it? All, all right. I don't want my, my, I don't really want it to disturb you. Thank you, Chairperson. <clears throat> Let us then observe a moment of silence for prayer and meditation. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we will continue with our program and I will now request the speaker of the Western Cape Legislature to do the welcoming address. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Mm. Honorable Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, uh, Ms. Uh, Sylvia Lucas, was our program director for this program at this stage. Uh, Honorable, De Honorable Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, Ms. Mr. Lichisa Tsinoli. Honorable Minister of the Western Cape Department of Social Development, Ms. Shana Fernandez. Honorable members of the National Assembly, honorable members of the NCOP present, and of course, the honorable members of the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. The Commission for Gender Equality, Commissioner Masibuko, the Fiscal and uh, the Financial and Fiscal Commission, Commissioner Rockman. Statistics South Africa, Mr. Mulai, executive mayors, speakers and councillors, distinguished guests, our friends in the media, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Deputy Chairperson, I welcome you to the Western Cape Provincial Parliament. And of course, I welcome you to the Western Cape Province. Thank you for choosing us as part of the uh, provinces where you are conducting this review of the high level session. It is important, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, because as you have indicated in the last uh, two sessions, uh, having followed the discussions that took place um, in the Cape Windings District, the Central Karoo District, um, the Garden Road District, I see you refer to it here as the Eden District. The new name is the Garden Road District. And of course, the West Coast District and the Overbeck District. Honorable Chairperson, we hear that women have spoken. They were represented by NGOs, pressure groups, civil society organizations, church organizations, um, individuals who are very active in the space as activists on, on women matters. A lot has been said, and of course, I think what is important here is that the Women Charter, as articulated in its preamble, it says, and I quote, 
as women citizens of South Africa, we are here to claim our rights. We want recognition and we respect, and we want respect for the work we do in the home, in the workplace, and in the community. Women say, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, we claim full and equal participation in the creation of a non-sexist, non-racist democratic society. For decades, patriarchy, colonialism, racism, and apartheid have subordinated and oppressed women within political, economic, and social life. Furthermore, at the heart of women marginalization is the patriarchal order that confines women to the domestic arena and reserves for men the arena where political power and authority reside. Conventionally, democracy and human rights have been defined and interpreted in terms of men's experiences. Society has been organized and, inst and, its, in and its institutions structured for the primary benefit of men. Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, it is important that as we conduct these sessions, we reflect how much has been done in the work of advancing the cause of women as defined in the Women's Charter. In closing the quote of what has been done since the beginning of this work in 1954, and of course as articulated in the 1994 Women's Charter that we deal with here, the agenda is not changed. Women demand equality, women demand the laws that will advance the participation of women in society, uh, in economy, in political fora, and of course, education and training as articulated by the 12 articles in the Women's Charter. The Federation of South African Women, which, con which converged in 1954, made demands on Albert Jefferson, made a call which is still a call today. When I see the report of the last two sessions, the immediate and the, and the first session, it does come out strongly that women in the Cape Winelands district, women in the Central Karoo and women in the Garden Roots, and of course, women in the West Coast district and Overbeck, they say three things among many. As articulated in Article 1, Honorable Chairperson, they say we need equality. They say we are tired of being abused and be killed by men. They say we need violence against women to stop now. But Honorable Chairperson, they say we need participation in the economy as articulated in Article 3. Now, as a man here, and as the speaker of this provincial parliament in the Western Cape, I say, especially if you look at the theme this year, when we, just, when we celebrated recently the International Women's Day, where we articulated a program that says it must be that not in my name. And I, 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 I lift my hand to say that not in my name shall women be victims. Not in my name shall women be oppressed at workplace. Not in my name shall women be oppressed in society. And not in my name shall women be victims of gender-based violence. Now, that is what we need to call society. Men in particular to stand up and protect and defend and support and promote the rights of women. The SNK Provincial Parliament supports the work that you do, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, uh, Sylvia Lucas. I think it can be said here by everyone present, you have done tremendously well uh, to ensure that you lead these programs and Honorable Lechisa Tinoli, that you have done this as parliament to ensure that parliament is, is at the center of not only legislating, these, these beautiful laws, but to monitor the implementation thereof. The Western Cape Provincial Parliament in 2019, where the Women's Parliament here, in 2020, we could not have a Women's, a women's Parliament as we know it, but we, had, we, we have ensured that we use virtual platforms to engage the stakeholders that are working in the space of women 
using forest targeted fora platforms where the forums on women, farm workers, um, rural, rural women participate in ensuring that we deal with the issues of prejudice, gender bias, and equality. Also in the Western Cape Provincial Parliament, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, we've got a very active Commonwealth Women's Parliament led by the Deputy Speaker in this legislature. And it is important that such programs and such um, platforms are supported in order to ensure that the work is done correctly and they get the necessary capacity that is needed. And we do so in this parliament, mindful of the responsibilities that comes with that. But also what is important as I end, Honorable Deputy Chairperson, the COVID-19 and its impact has caused significant problems in the way in which the women programs have been implemented, both what we do in society and of course in government, we've seen that women have been victims of unemployment, victims of hunger, and the programs that have been implemented to target those kind of sectors to address this priority. And in parliament here, the Western Cape Provincial Legislature, as the speaker, I approved 50,000 rents uh, in order to allocate to members, in order to do a feeding, feeding, feeding program and support women and support other stakeholders, especially uh, in poor communities, in, pro in order to respond to the disaster and in order to ensure that the PPE and food programs in communities are supported. So these are some of the things that we have to do as parliament, not to be spectators, but to support the work in our communities, especially as constituency heads, as parliamentarians. So I'm going to encourage all of us to use this platform because women have said in these regions here in the districts, we don't want a talk show, but we want to use this platform as an opportunity to reflect and take decisions, which is resolutions that will influence the agenda of government and the agenda of the state in general. So thank you very much for having me here and obviously for using this opportunity to ensure that parliament is at the center of leading in society and using people as an important um, facet of advancing the work of parliament. So you are welcome and good luck as you conclude today. And this is not the last opportunity for us to reflect and we will monitor the work that we do around the review of this charter. And of course, this high level session uh, is very much welcome. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy, Deputy Chairperson, and to the delegates present here, and to all the speakers, good luck. You're all welcome. Thank you very much. May God bless you all. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. I, I will keep my video off because apparently I'm not uh, uh, I'm not totally visible. So I'm not I'm not sure the the speaker of 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 Parliament can just indicate to me whether he is already now at the stage where he can hear us. The deputy speaker, can you hear us? He's been, he's been complaining that he, he, he cannot hear us. I don't know what is happening with his, uh, I don't know what is happening with his uh, uh, gadget, but something is wrong. So I will request now that the chairperson of the multi-party women's caucus, if you can just chair the session for now, because I'm going to, to do the input that the deputy speaker was supposed to be doing because he's got a serious problem with his, uh, Connectivity is connected, but he cannot hear us. And I don't know whether we will be able to hear him. If he can just indicate. If we can hear him, we can continue. Deputy Speaker, can you unmute yourself? Can you unmute so that we can see whether we can hear you? You know, with this connectivity, sometimes we've got so much challenges. So, uh, 
I think we will we will then continue. Honorable Bilankulu, are you are you ready to to take over the chairing of the session? Deputy Chairperson, are you ready to take over the chairing of yes, the I session? Can. I will I will I will can allow I them please. to I will allow them to to give you the program, and I I will continue in the meantime with the contextualization of what we've been doing, because okay. really, Comrade. Honorable Lichisa is, is really struggling. So Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, the Speaker of the Provincial Legislature, the Premier in absentia, members of the Provincial Executive Council present, representatives from our chapter nine institutions, ladies and gentlemen, 2019, Mark 65 years since the adoption of the 1954 Women's Charter and 25 years since the adoption of the 1994 Women's Charter for Effective Equality. By its very nature, the Women's Charter depicts key milestones in history of women's activism, women's struggle, and the united fight by women against all forms of oppression and discrimination. 65 years to date, Women have demonstrated a collective resilience to unite, to unite across race and political doctrines in order to fight against patriarchy and discriminatory laws and practices. And this unity of purpose culminated in the adoption of the 1954 and 1994 charters respectively, with both charters serving as the backdrop to the development of a comprehensive policy and legislative regime Women have continued to make remarkable strides through the advancement and adoption of a broad continuum of policy, legislatives, and systemic advances. Whereas 65 years ago, a revolution was sparked by women to fight all forms of discrimination, particularly as they pertain to restricted movement, ironically today still. The struggle against freedom of movement still persists. Women and girl children lived in fear, they are terrorized in their homes, brutally attacked in public spaces and savagely killed in the most unsuspecting places. This brutal onslaught seeks to keep women bound, restricted and relegated to the fringes of society as if they have no place of belonging. The national gender machinery, which was adopted years ago as a blueprint to give direction to policy and programs for women's empowerment and gender equality, as well as hold government accountable in no, is not being implemented. Structures of this uh, machinery, those that exist, continue to experience challenges, which emphasize that in order for the national gender machinery to make an input in addressing gender-based violence, the challenges and weaknesses of the NGM must be addressed. Key challenges experienced by the national gender machinery, which require review and intervention, include the following. A lack of coordination and synergy in terms of planning and programming between the various structures. A lack of coordination between a perceived overlap in terms of the mandates of the various structures. A lack of authority in terms of the placement and powers vested in the structure, particularly in relation to the gender focal points. Furthermore, some of the structures do not have the requisite financial and human capacity for them to be able to carry out their mandates. If we are serious about changing the material conditions of women, then appropriate legislative framework and implementation plans must be in place for this to happen. It is, however, important to note that this alone will not necessarily eradicate gender inequality as the implementation of the strategies and plans that emanate from legislation will determine its ultimate outcome. A key measure for ensuring gender transformation and equal participation between women and men is the allocation of budgets to effect policy and legislative changes. The link between economic and political empowerment is key to enhancing the equal participation of men and women in decision-making. Therefore, Implementing commitments towards gender equality requires intentional measures to incorporate a gender perspective in planning and budgeting framework and concrete investment in addressing gender gaps. Parliament constitutional mandate requires that it provides a meaningful opportunity for the involvement of the public in the legislative and other processes. Hence, for the past month, 
We have been crisscrossing the country, district by district, gathering information on how to change the material condition of South African women for the better. We have been doing this by embarking in most robust review process of the Women's Charter, which is underpinned by a strong law reform component, focusing on the review of policy and legislation currently in place with the aim of identifying policy gaps and gaps in legislation. Review processes will also assess the efficacy of structural arrangements in place, particularly as they pertain to the national gender machinery, gender budgeting processes and related members. Furthermore, the review processes will culminate in the adoption of improved policy and legislative oversight mechanisms while advancing to remove all structural, institutional and cultural barriers that continue to impact the pace of transformation as, is, as it pertains to gender equality in South Africa. We are here to appraise you a member of the provincial executive, we are here to appraise you and your collective on the findings emanating from the Western Cape review sessions. And this session will afford parliament the opportunity to be appraised about provincial action plans towards a gender transformation discourse, which will lead to parliament developing an outcome-based oversight framework, which will be used as a yardstick to assess gender transformation in the country as a whole. We appreciate the input by the honorable speaker and also in the fact that we know we've got the support of the provincial legislature in making sure that in this task that we actually undertaking, we will be having the support of those that we are uh, trying to take with us in the whole process. Honorable Chairperson, with that, I thank you very much and I give over to you again. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Chairperson, uh, Ms. Lucas, for your contextualization review. We're now moving on to poverty map mapping uh, perspective, where I'm going to call upon Statistic SA, represented by Mr. S. Molai. Mr. Molai, over to you. Uh, good day, Chair. I hope you can hear me. So, Lee? Can you hear me? Yes, 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 Mr. Mwai. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, good day, colleagues. Um, my name is Sori Mulai from Statese. I'm here to provide uh, context in terms of the issues that we're discussing today. And I think um, the starting point will be to understand the population of South Africa. And this is based on the mid-year estimate, um, the 2000 and, uh, 2020, and we estimated around 59.6 million South African. And I think the next slide uh, will try to break down uh, the population according to different indicators. I think firstly, let's look at the, the spread in terms of, um, in terms of the, the province. We've seen that half of the population lives in three provinces, Gauteng, KZN, and the province that we're going to discuss today is the Western Cape. Uh, Western Cape, we, if, if you look at it, uh, we are sitting around uh, 7 million uh, South Africans. In terms of proportion, it's around 11.8%. If you break it down by province, uh, by districts within the province, I mean the province, yes, of Western Cape, you notice that uh, for seat of Cape Town, uh, around 66% of the population of Western Cape are actually concentrated in the, the, the city of, of Cape Town Metro. And you can see the other uh, district, um, uh, uh, Garden Court is sitting around 9% and West Coast is sitting around 7%. I think this is very important because you need to understand where the population, the spread of the population according to the districts. In terms of the sex, um, about 50.7 of the population in Western Cape uh, is female and 49.3 it's uh, male. Break it down by district, uh, Overbeck has a slightly lower proportion of females than males, but you see that for other districts they are above uh, 50%. The other indicator or the other, uh, um, um, other way of looking at the population is to look at the, the age categories 
And you can see that for Western Cape, uh, we estimating around 62% of the population to be youth and adult, which means we are saying that it's, we, our population is around 59, I mean, between 15 and 59 years old. And you can see that is the, the, the second lowest um, just before um, Gauteng. Uh, if you look at the age children under, under 15, within the province, it's around 27.7%, uh, which is also lower than the, the national figures. But an interesting enough, uh, when you look at the elderly, uh, which is 60 plus, Western Cape is sitting around 10.3%, uh, which is the, 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 the second highest after Eastern Cape. Let's now look at the living arrangement for children. Um, we've noticed that uh, nationally we're sitting about 42% uh, who indicated that they live with their mothers only. But if you zoom into Western Cape, where we noticed that around 48.5% indicated that they live with both parents, meaning with mother and father in the household. And uh, those who indicated that they live with the fathers is only 3.6%. So living with both parents is, uh, if you look at it across all the provinces so for, for Western Cape and, and for Houting, um, it has higher proportions compared to other provinces. And I think now you can see it now on this slide where we are now comparing um, female headed household and male headed households. Here we, we were measuring whether within the household, whether there's someone uh, who's, 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 who's employed. And we have noticed that 20.6% uh, 20, of female headed household in Western Cape do not have an employed household member. Comparing it with the male headed household is only 17.6%. So the gap between the, the female and male head household, headed household uh, in Western Cape, uh, the gap is not wider compared to the other provinces. Uh, where, for example, if you look at the national figures, we're sitting around 40.6% for female and then we're sitting around 22% for, for, for males. Let's now look at the poverty line. We've got three poverty lines that we are measuring from status A, the upper bound poverty line, the lower bound poverty line, and the full poverty line. So we are going to compare these poverty lines um, with the national uh, uh, poverty lines and we will compare it with the provinces. So if you look at the top part, it talks to the national figures and the bottom part talks to the provincial um, uh, figures. You can see that for food poverty, it, we can only classify around 10% um, of the population that we can classify as, 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 as poor based on the food poverty line. And this is quite lower compared to the national, which is around 25%. And we've, even with the other two poverty line, you can still see compared it with the national that in Western Cape, uh, the, the proportions are quite lower compared to the national uh, picture. The other way to look at poverty is to look at the multidimensional poverty indicators. Uh, this is help us to understand poverty in a holistic view. And these are some of the indicators that we are measuring with four dimensions. Um, we look at it from the health perspective, from education, living standard, and economic activities. And this we've been tracking it since from 2001. Um, which is our census, and then the next census was sitting around, uh, was it at 2011, and our community survey. And you can see throughout uh, these three data points that Western Cape is always being uh, lower than the national average. And if you look at the last point, it's almost less than 3%, uh, which means that um, it, there's, there's fewer um, um, individual in the provinces that we can classify them as, as, as multidimensional poor using uh, this indicator. What drives uh, uh, the multidimensional uh, poverty indicators? Uh, we've noticed that over time, unemployment contributed a lot. Uh, in 2001, it was around 33%. 10 years later, we realized that it actually contributes around 40%. And now in 2016, we realized that it's now actually contributing around uh, half of the, the share of the, the, all the indicators. 
So it tells us that uh, unemployment is actually driving uh, the multi-dimensional poverty um, uh, uh, indicator. Let's look at the household in terms of the sources of income. Uh, you look at Western Cape, almost 70% of the household indicated that their household income is salaries and around 10% indicated the grants. And I think you can look at these figures in relation to the national um, um, proportions. You notice that for nationally, we're sitting around 55% for salaries and 20% for grants. So I think this also gave a perspective in terms of understanding the profile of the province in relation to other provinces and also uh, the, in relation to the national picture. Let's zoom into service delivery. We'll look at electricity and sanitation over time, whether how the province has been performing. In 2019, Western Cape was above the national average in household connected to main electricity. And I think we are sitting around 88.4%. And this has been uh, the picture throughout since from 2002. Looking at the access to sanitation, um, again, we see that there's high levels of household uh, with access to improved access to sanitation. Now we're sitting around 94.5%. So it's, 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 it's also, you can also see it against other provinces, um, but for, for Western Cape, it's, it's, it's the picture, I mean, the, 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 the numbers are showing that it's actually above even the national uh, averages. Looking at the vulnerable groups, uh, Chair, we, here we are talking about uh, looking at um, the proportions of households that have uh, indicated that they have um, some sort of a small gardens or um, living stock. And Western Cape, uh, in terms of, of these indicators, it was the lowest around 3.6%. Uh, and here, like I said, Chair, is, is we are not talking about big farms here. We're talking just, uh, you know, if you have chickens and, you know, uh, the garden that you can actually uh, for survival. So around 3.6%. 6% for, for Western Cape. And the highest is, um, is Western, Eastern Cape and Mpopo and KZN. Looking at the household that reported that uh, they, uh, they've suffered from hunger, um, you can look at it against male and female uh, headed household. Um, for Western Cape, you, you see that for, for male, you're sitting around 12.4%. Uh, and for female, you're only sitting at 11.1%. And, and I think you could see across all the province, uh, Western Cape is the only province where males were slightly higher uh, than, 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 um, than, than the female. So the blue bar is, 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 is higher than the, the, the pink bar. Breaking down um, in terms of district and looking at the households that are more likely to run out of money to buy food in the past 12 months of the survey, uh, Overberg and, and, and Central Karoo had the highest rate of female-headed households that are likely to run out of money to buy food. And you can see that the proportions are higher than the actual numbers for, 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 for the province. They're above the 15% for female-headed households. Uh, this district, uh, Central Karoo is sitting at 18.5% uh, and Owenberg sitting around 18.2% for female-headed household. Let's look at the gap, uh, the gender pay gap between male and female. Uh, we're tracking this from our quarterly labor force survey and we've been running this since 2013. And we've seen over time that uh, the gap between the female and male uh, in 2018, uh, we, we were sitting at around 76%, which means that um, there's still a gap between male and female in terms of uh, the earnings. Breaking down that same indicator by provinces, um, you see that in the Western Cape female end 86.9% of men, men monthly earnings in 2018, Although it's, it's higher compared to the other provinces, there's still a gap between uh, what the male are getting and what the female are, are receiving on, on a monthly basis. And I think this is very important for, for the discussion of today. And, and I hope that the, the next uh, speakers will also touch on, on these issues.
Let's look at occupations. Uh, this is among those who said are employed in the Western K female account uh, for 43%, 41.3%. Um, this is for my general uh, uh, occupation. So if you look at um, the total, you are sitting around 45.9% and 54.1% 54 is for, for male. But then if you break it down, you see that for managers, uh, for female is only 41.3 and for males is 58.6. I think this is very important because as I was presenting, I presented the profile of the province in terms of male and female. And now that you see it in terms of those who are employed, how it's pending out. And you can see that uh, for even for um, skilled agriculture, it's only sitting at 11.3% in terms of male and female split. split. Experiencing of violence, uh, these are the three indicators that we are measuring uh, physical violence, emotional violence, and sexual, offense, uh, sexual violence. Uh, for physical violence, it's around 21%. Um, those who've indicated that they've ever experienced it, and for sexual violence, it's sitting about 6%. And these are always, when I present this, I always indicate that this is a very difficult indicator to measure because most of these um, violence are happening within the household. And from the survey perspective, it's very, very difficult to measure this because you have to go to the same household and also get a, a, a response from, 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 from the respondent who are within that particular household. Break it down by provinces, uh, Western Cape, you see physical violence is sitting around 21%, emotional uh, violence sitting around 20 and uh, experience of sexual violence is sitting around 4%. Um, and I think Chair, this is my last slide. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mulai, for the poverty ma mapping perspective. We're now proceeding to the Commissioner, the Commission for Gender Equality. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Mazibuko. Chairperson, I don't know whether. Commissioner Mazibuko is here, but Commissioner Malule, uh, uh, in Tabi saying I forgot the surname now, Muleko, she is on the platform, but she is not well, which means we won't be getting the input from the, the Commission on Gender Equality, but that she will she will uh, distribute it so for the attention of the of the member of the Executive Council. So uh, she, she is really on the platform, but she's not well. She said something is also, she's fluish and something is wrong with her voice. So can we proceed and go to the, uh, the FFC? No, Please. thank you very much, Deputy Chair, for the info. Uh, we're proceeding to FFC, Commissioner E. Rockman for Intergovernmental and Fiscal Relation Overview. Over to you, madam. Th thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, our Honourable Deputy Chair of the NCOP, our members of Parliament and the Western Cape Legislature, um, all colleagues and participants, good afternoon. Um, the primary focus of the Financial and Fiscal Commission is the equitable division of nationally collected revenue among the three spheres of government and any other financial and fiscal matters. This Women's Charter review process provides us with an opportunity to assess the progress we have made to realize the overarching commitments to non-sexism and gender equality in the strategic and operational work of all levels of government. It also enables us to identify the areas in which we must consolidate and strengthen our focus and implementation actions. Now, the foundation of post-apartheid South Africa's commitment to gender equality is, the, is established in the 1994 Women's Charter for Effective Equality, as well as the Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights. The roadmap for the realization of gender equality is informed by multiple international commitments, such as the 1995 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the Beijing Declaration and Platform of Action, as well as the 2012 SADC Protocol on Gender, in including also furthermore the Sustainable Development Goals. The translation of the principal commitment to gender equality in South Africa further evolved through amongst others 
the 2000 Framework for Transforming Gender Relations, the 2000 National Policy Framework for Women's Empowerment and Gender Equality, the 2007 Gender Policy Framework for Local Government, and the 2010 National Development Plan. The 2018 Framework on Gender Responsive Planning, Budgeting, Monitoring, Evaluation and Auditing acknowledges the need to locate gender responsive planning and budgeting within the overall public policy cycle and public financing systems. Amongst its strategic objectives is locating women's empowerment and gender equality at the center of public policy priorities, results-based planning and budgeting and accountability. It also includes the allocation of adequate and equitable resources for women's empowerment and gender equality linked to broader public finance reforms. An implementation plan is also included. The finalization of this comprehensive framework must be prioritized. There are numerous important initiatives that are focusing on this work, including the Women's Multi-Party Caucus's review of the current draft, which highlights, amongst other, its limitations as a polity framework that strengthens institutional capacity at national, provincial, and local level for aligning service delivery with the imperatives of promoting gender equity, the lack of expertise in the state to take up gender responsive budgeting and planning, the difficulty in accessing disaggregated data to review planning and budgeting processes from a gender perspective, and the lack of a framework for incorporating gender as an analytical variable into government's monitoring and evaluation processes. We must remember that gender responsive budgeting involves a full process from analysis of budget programs from a gender perspective to a process of change based on identified gender equality gaps, as well as the integration of gender perspectives throughout the budget process. It essentially aims to mainstream gender in economic policy making and seeks to transform the entire budget process. Gender-based budgeting must be aligned to our national development goals on gender equality and women's development. It does not involve creating separate budgets for women and girls or simply increasing specific budget allocations directed to these groups. Instead, it involves collecting budget revenues and allocating expenditures that address persistent inequalities between women and girls and men and boys. A comprehensive approach would include at least the monitoring stage of the budget cycle, that is the policy appraisal, beneficiary assessment, and gender disaggregated public expenditure. It also includes a focus on revenue, how revenue is generated, who is contributing, and the effects of the tax system on men and women, the overall structure of the tax system, and the effect of tax incentives. Lastly, also it includes an overall analysis of the budget proposals, and there we talk of the gender disaggregated analysis. It is critical that we learn from the challenges and successes of past gender responsive budgeting initiatives as we continue on this journey. The original IDP guide packs for local government included guidelines for mainstreaming gender in IDPs and set out an approach in which gender was incorporated at each stage of the IDP process. It emphasized the role of the, that the IDP can play in mainstreaming gender in the policies and implementation plans of municipalities, as well as the importance of introducing key people, such as the gender focal points, structures such as gender forums, and monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to institutionalize government's commitment to achieving gender equality. National government does set the parameters and provided crucial starting points for municipalities. The recent introduction of the district development model opens a new door through which the gender equality journey should continue. The district development model is a practical intergovernmental relations mechanism that enables all three spheres of government to work together with communities and stakeholders to plan, budget and implement in unison. It builds on the white paper on local government as the next step towards achieving our vision of developmental local government. An IGR fiscal mechanism, system and process must be an inherent key element of this. We need to reflect and determine to what extent our budgeting instruments and processes have been adapted to reflect 
the district development model and assess if we have achieved consistency in translating the principles of gender equity and equality, not only in the conceptualization, but also in the implementation of the district development model. The extension of the municipal systems improvement grant to provide for the rollout of the DDM, as announced in the 2021 budget speech, will have to be monitored and evaluated from a gender perspective. We have to appreciate that the district development model is therefore not only a local government matter, but provincial and national government has its own unique roles and responsibilities to fulfill. We need to find a way to practically and publicly express a view on the correlation between our planning, budgeting, and public expenditure from a gender perspective in our democratic institutions of governance at national, provincial, and local level. The voice of parliament, the NCOP legislatures, and municipal councils will undoubtedly assist in taking this narrative forward. The realities of Black African female-headed household, being the poorest of the poor, unemployment rates being historically higher for women than men, and gender inequality reflected in wage gaps, must find direct reflection not only in the annual vertical division of revenue between the three spheres of government, but also within the horizontal budget allocations within national, provincial, and local government. The FFC has previously conducted research which reflected on the gender perspective as taken up in IDPs and budgets of local government. And our presentation today reflects some of the key findings of that research. Namundi will take us through the presentation specifically with regard to the research findings. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, Commissioner. Uh, uh, good afternoon, honorable members and the colleagues. I will take you through to slide. Yes, this one. Thank you, Kevin. Slide three. Uh, as Commissioner uh, Rockman has indicated that the FFC has done a study where it assessed the gender responsiveness of municipal budgeting processes uh, approach to see if municipalities uh, do indeed integrate uh, gender budgeting uh, in their plans. Uh, what we did here uh, was to select uh, uh, 30 municipalities randomly. Uh, the Western Cape was part of the municipality. The Overbeck district uh, was part of, of the study, as well as uh, George local municipalities, as well as Cape Akalas. They were part of those municipalities that were, were selected including the, uh, the case study where also Western Cape, the city of Cape Town was also part of that. Uh, what the study focused on was on four sectors. Can hear you. Chief, we've lost our sound. Thank you. I wonder if there is a connectivity issue. Let me just check with Namondi, otherwise, I will have to continue. Can I just okay. speak with the chairperson? Please, please. I'm sorry about that. I think I lost the network somehow. Uh, the next slide, uh, Kevin, where there are findings. Thank you. Uh, the results on the findings from the IDP review was that uh, there is a generally lack of gender mainstreaming and women empowerment as approach at the municipalities, as well as lack of gender uh, disaggregated data between females and males. If the data is there, it's only used to profile the unemployment in the area, yet this data can also be used to, 
to inform part of the gender uh, problems that the municipalities can, can, can be involved in. Also, what we found out from these results that uh, it's more about uh, equity uh, uh, versus the mainstreaming of gender equality. That is, it's more about the number of women that have been employed at the particular municipality, yet there is lack of uh, gender equality commitments and improvements in terms of uh, driving the agenda for women empowerment. There's also weak translation of gender equality commitments into fiscal commitments. What do we mean by this is that IDPs uh, show little evidence of the manner in which the IDP planning processes and budget offices have budgeted for gender mainstreaming in their programs in the municipalities. The next slide. In terms of the case study, what we found out was that there is generally a poor translation of the national agenda on women empowerment and gender equality into local government program, as well as the inadequate uh, gender disaggregated data uh, most of the uh, events that happen are, are related to if there is Women's Day, you'll find out there will be something happening. And after that, it will happen again next year. There is also lack of gender budgeting training and capacity building of decision makers, as well as poor institutionalization of gender responsive budgeting, as well as the absence of analysis of the gender impact. Uh, of existing revenues and expenditure. That means of the expenditure, who, who is benefiting uh, between the, all the genders of the revenues, the taxes, who is benefiting or who is the tax regressing to, towards. So that information is also lacking. Next slide. Also some of the reasons for limited uh, gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting in the local government is due to absence of an approved gender policy across the municipalities, as well as gender mainstreaming strategy. Uh, and there's also a personnel in management, those who are supposed to make decision, as well as budget officers, those who are supposed to track the expenditure have limited knowledge of how to conduct this. Also gender equality indicators and the collection of gender disaggregated information is limited. Next slide. In terms of the recommendation, the FFC recommended that the national and provincial government should run gender budgeting pilots in few municipalities first and evaluate the results before wider application can, can happen. These pilots could be linked to ensuring gender disaggregated data for key conditional grants as per the grant framework in the division of revenue. We know that the framework has also conditional grants, various conditional grants on water and sanitation, ECD. So the FFC is of the view that this approach, it can be followed. It will do indeed uh, improve uh, gender programs in, in the national and provincial government. Also the national and provincial government should ensure municipal integrated uh, plans are institutionalized and that there's also gender planning by sector. As I've mentioned, those uh, four uh, economic uh, indicators that do uh, alleviate the plight of women, which is on water and sanitation, the local economic development. And uh, the FFC is of the view that after this, they need to be included, they need to include gender disaggregated performance indicators and targets and provide gender budgeting, good practice guides and toolkits. Also the FFC recommended that the national and provincial government provide guidelines for collecting sex disaggregated data for budgeting process and, and ensure that municipalities have the capacity to analyze budget through the gender lens. Uh, the government response to the recommendation was that government support uh, the proposal, which will ensure that the collection and allocation of public resources is effectively carried out and contribute to advancing gender equality and, women, and women's empowerment. It will also provide tools to assess the different needs and contribution of all the genders within the existing revenues, expenditure and allocation, and will call for adjusted budget uh, policies to benefit all these groups. The next slide. At the local uh, government, the FFC recommended that 
the local government should institutionalize gender responsive budgeting process, which should be linked to IDP plans, as we know that the IDPs are the strategic uh, documents of the municipalities in terms of the planning, uh, the process and the implementation. Also, the local government should build capacity for gender mainstreaming and gender responsive budgeting at the local level. As you can see that from the findings, you find out those who are supposed to make decisions or those who are supposed to track the expenditures, they have limited uh, knowledge on how to do this. Also, the local government should ensure gender responsive appropriation and budget allocation, as well as ensure gender sensitive public participation take place at consultation level at all local uh, government levels. In terms of the response by government was that a gender responsive budget, budget analysis, along with legislation and other practical policy measures can address gender bias and discrimination in the country. It is indeed a step towards increased accountability as well as public transparency. And it can shift economic policies leading to gains across society for all. However, the proposal implementation may be hindered by capacity constraints at the municipal level. I think this is my last slide. Thank you, Chair. Mm, thank you very much, uh, Nomande. Uh, I've seen that uh, the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly is on the platform. I would now hand over to him to take the program forward as is the one to start with the with session number two. The Deputy Chief Whip, Honorable Zinoli. I, I, I'm sure he's still experiencing the same challenges or is it better now? Uh, no, uh, uh, Chairperson uh, of the session. Um, I've reconnected, I've now been hearing you. I lost uh, earlier on, but I suggest because of the, this technical problem that you continue to chair, uh, I will make some observations uh, towards the end. Uh, please, if you don't mind, uh, continue to do the good job. And I noticed that Doris Dragude is on your case. This is why you call me by her job. Uh, <laughs> Ah, uh, definitely speaker. <laughs> we are told that when we are being called by our elders or sent to do something by our elders, you have to, to do it. Now, thank you very much, uh, honorable members and all the delegates. Let's proceed to, now we're going to listen to gender mainstreaming program of action by the Western Cape province, where Ms. S. Fernandez, the MEC for Social Development, will take us up. Over to you, Ms. Fernandez. Good, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Honorable Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, the Deputy Chairperson of the National Assembly, the Honorable Sonoli, to all MECs, uh, deputy spe speakers, deputy speakers, councillors, mayors, present, distinguished guests, thank you for the opportunity to represent the Western Cape in this very valuable engagement. I think it is important to firstly appreciate the presentations that they were made. The Stats SA presentation was deeply, deeply insightful, as was the the FCC, if that's correct, just about what it right. Um, it is provided yes, yes. the Fiscal Finance uh, Commission. Yeah, so it has created, it has uh, piqued my interest because there are quite a few pointers that we would need to pick up on, and I also note the recommendations of the the um, commissioner for Financial and Fiscal Commission regarding the municipalities that were assessed for this exercise. 
So, uh, Honourable Chairperson, allow me to just um, firstly indicate that our Premier is not available and I was tasked in his absence to deliver a response and to talk to what it is that we are doing in the Western Cape. I have sent a, short, a reduced version of the presentation. I don't know if it is ready to be flighted. Can I just check with the if you've received the presentation. All right, then, Honourable Chairperson, in the interest of time, allow me uh, to continue without the presentation being flighted. And I, I would like to just, um, as a response, talk to the Western Cape's prioritising of gender mainstreaming in each of its departments. We have gender responsive programs and, budget and budgets. Our strategic plan for 2019 to 2024 and the provincial framework for human rights mainstreaming as set out in the Western Cape's government position on women empowerment and how it should be mainstreamed into the budgets and plans of departments actually talks to the presentation that was just a shade with us. So I do believe that it is important that we go back, take the inputs that were presented here and share that at a, a Premier's Coordinating Forum where we have all the municipal managers and mayors present. And I will certainly ask for a specific slot to deal with this at our next PCF. I also would like to touch on the evaluation strategy that is in the process of being compiled and will, it, and will make a reference to the inclusion of gender responsiveness and vulnerable groupings specifically, because the STATS SA presentation has provided some insights. It is not new to me. I have worked in the Central Karoo for over three and a half years, and I'm very familiar with the levels of unemployment that exist in Murraysburg, Beaufort West, Nelsport, Merbeville, um, Buchamke, etc. So we also have a situation in the Overberg, which is uh, predominantly, and not forgetting Kanaland, I think would also be added to, to that um, grouping of vulnerable people. So our three draft APPs have been assessed by the Department of the Premier to, for gender mainstreaming feedback, and the departments have now been told where it is that they would need to uh, improve on the efforts to ensure gender mainstreaming. The Office of the Department of the Premier was also instrumental in setting up the Office of the Children's Commissioner, which is the first of its kind and the only one in South Africa at present. From a local government perspective, the Department of Local Government has formed partnerships to roll out gender mainstreaming support initiatives to municipalities. The department has rolled out accredited gender mainstreaming training to municipal gender focal persons. And then the department, in partnership with the Commission for Gender Equality of Commission, annually assesses the IDPs of all 30 municipalities. And it's a pity that we did not have the, op the opportunity to listen to the presentation by the Commissioner for Gender Equality. And then Salga also has a well-functioning women's commission in the province that meets regularly. So in 2019, at the start of the sixth parliament, uh, cabinet mandated me to lead the gender-based violence focus in the province. So on the, uh, I'm on the national strategic plan, thank you. So on the uh, 11th of December, 2019, we launched what was called 365 days of awareness because 
I am of the firm opinion that women don't only get murdered during 16 days of activism, but a woman dies every four hours every day in this country. So following on the launch of the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence and Femicide at the end of April 2020, I requested a review of all the current DSD programs and interventions to see how it addresses GBVF and gender-based budgeting directly and indirectly. And after that, a cabinet decision was made to develop a gender-based provincial transversal working group. So late last year, I established a transversal working group where every single department of government is represented. And uh, we are now working together to ensure that every department provides inputs to the GBV plans for the 21-22 financial year. We are also working to develop our provincial, we are not going to call it a provincial strategic plan, but we are rather focusing on a provincial implementation plan. The next slide, please. And the purpose of our implementation plan is to align the Western Cape government's GBV services and interventions to the NSP and its implementation. However, I must admit that we would need to strengthen our relationship with a local government. I have, though, had the privilege of addressing the Salga Women's Commission in the province on two occasions, and I do believe that that is a useful avenue to engage with women and to share the presentations that were shared here. So I will certainly be requesting an opportunity on, at their next quarterly women's meeting. So we want to strengthen collaboration between our government departments and external stakeholders. And when I talk to Western Cape government, the whole of government approach, we are driving a gender sensitivity campaign because I believe that charity begins at home. We cannot save the world if our officials in government, if our members of the executive, and it starts with the Premier, leads from the front in understanding gender sensitivity, the whole GBVF package, as well as political will and the need to drive gender-based budgeting to achieve the much needed outcomes for not only gender parity and equity, but to ensure that women have a rightful place at the table. So we are also exploring new opportunities and obviously the document is a living document which we can dip into on a monthly basis when we meet. And I, I must say I'm very privileged in that our Premier certainly does lead from the front on the 25th of August last year, we actually had a cabinet session dedicated to gender-based violence solely. And all the stakeholders from local, provincial and national government, including chapter nines, the Department of Justice, whoever was needed to be at the table actually presented in that cabinet session. So we are now starting to see greater alignment and collaboration. I'll now just quickly touch on some of the work we are doing in the Department of Social Development, which is the lead department for GBV. We appointed 30 social workers with a GBV focus, and they have been spread across the province. One of the challenges with the extra social workers we received is that they require supervision. And so we are now in the process of revisiting the social workers to their supervisors to ensure the management of these social workers in a way that ensures they don't, that they don't carry too much of a caseload. The Provincial VP Forum is managed by the Department of the Premier, and obviously we all provide inputs there. 
and each region in the city, we have metro, north, south, east, and west, and we have five district municipalities. They have a VP coordinator, and we also have GBV forums established. I think of one specific forum that is headed by our DSD director in the Southern Cape, Mrs. Mari Hendricks, and that forum has taken off quite significantly. Then I'll just touch on budgets, which are important. Shelter services uh, takes is a 62% of the budget. Service organizations, there's a 38% split. And our total transfer budget for GBV is 60, um, is it 60, 60 million, 60 million, 230,000. So for shelters, which is a very critical component in this conversation, because our women in rural areas have sadly been neglected. And I'm very pleased to announce that the National Department of Public Works Minister Patricia De Lille and I and Minister um, uh, Zulu, last year on the 4th of March at a media presser, we had six assets handed over to the Western Cape, and that was through National Public Works, and I shall, on the 26th of March, I will be opening our first shelter in the Central Karoo District. So we have 19 that are up and running. I welcome the additional six shelters. However, we do have challenges with the shelters in that um, there is still some work to be done by public works. And we also need to engage the municipalities regarding a safety and fire certification and, and all the necessary. Our victim support services, um, as approved funding, as I said, it is there, 19 organizations provide victim support services. And we do work very closely with the National Women's Shelter Movement, as well as the Western Cape Women's Shelter Movement. So we have also hosted webinars on a monthly basis. And we generally con conduct them round about the 25th of the month which is the UN designated day. And we have engaged our house mothers from shelters. We have engaged activists. We have engaged civil society. And in March, we will be starting a series of what is called Courageous Conversations, where we will be using the UN theme of Choose to Challenge. And the first one will be an internal conversation with men in government, because I do believe that there is a lot of work that still needs to take place within government, whether it is at a provincial, local or national government level. If you could turn the page, please. We have memorandums of understanding as the Department of Social Development with most of the 30 municipalities within our province. And I have requested that every MOU must have GBV as a high priority area for intervention. And I have also requested that we focus on local drug action committees, otherwise known as ALDACs, because substance abuse cannot be seen in isolation because it is a key contributor to abuse within the, the, in the bigger system. One of the challenges that has been expressed, municipalities indicate that they do not have funding to give effect to these priorities. And obviously that would be the conversation that would need to be taken up. With COVID-19, women bore the brunt of um, unemployment, which the Stats SA presentation alluded to. We have seen something like 100,000 jobs decimated in the ECD sector. And it is sad that our ECD sector is actually on its knees and we really need to, as not only a Western Cape government, 
but as a country, look at the ECG sector because that is where the most vulnerability has been exposed as a result of COVID. One of the other uh, fallouts of COVID-19 is that of psychosocial support and mental health, especially when our women started uh, taking ill with COVID. We then set up an intervention with the Thousand Women Trust um, to grow a community-based support network. And our first intervention was a trauma training workshop via WhatsApp. We've had 11 groups of staff and community-based partners who did the course. And I must say that this project was so well received that it has now moved into, I believe, the Eastern Cape and Gauteng. So it is an online training course. It's a WhatsApp course that is focused on trauma and recovery. And then it moves through to gender awareness, entrepreneurship, and they are adding modules as they continue with this program. The next slide, please. I'm, I've covered quite a bit on the safe houses already. As I said, we have six new houses. I'm very excited about this. I hope that we'll be able to get the infrastructure work sorted. And then, as I said, our first one will be opening on the 26th of March. The challenges, zoning, health and safety certificates, and perimeter fencing. We all know that with our shelters, and I visited two shelters on Monday. I visited Sisters Incorporated in Kenilworth and the Athlone House of Safety in Paul. And the first thing that struck me was the level of security that needs to be uh, entrenched at our safe houses. If we don't follow the norms and standards, we could have perpetrators trying to follow their victims and to gain access to the safe houses. We have, and um, the next slide please, we have in our province under the leadership of the Premier embarked on a Western Cape government recovery plan the recovery plan has four legs, the first one being the COVID response. Our second leg is that of safety. Our third leg is jobs, because with employment comes dignity and the ability to maintain a family and a household. And the fourth one is that of uh, well-being and dignity and that is a work stream which I lead. It used to be called the humanitarian work stream. And within the dignity humanitarian work stream, we focus not only on gender-based violence, but we also focus on homelessness, food aid to food security, amongst others. So community safety have rolled out 11 area-based safety teams within the metro. They are busy doing a pilot in Hanover Park where they have deployed LEAP officers. We also have five district area-based safety teams and I was privileged to attend the Overberg safety area meeting just last week. So one of the Department of Community Safety's key um, interventions is that of introducing court watching briefs. So where we find women and children murdered in extreme situations, and bear in mind that any life lost is one too many, we attach what is called a court watching brief to that case. A prosecutor or a senior legal person would be present to ensure that the court, that the matter does not fall off the roll. What is interesting, we are picking up that within the justice system, there are faults because I think we had more than 50 cases fall off and we are now doing a follow-up to understand what is happening in that space. Citizens in the Western Cape can go to an email address called monitoring.gbv at Western Cape and they can request a watching brief be placed on any femicide or child murder matter if they so require. Community safety have done 
the awareness. I believe that awareness and prevention is important. So they've done a booklet and a poster on GBV. We also, as social development, do campaigns in taxis, in bathrooms, in malls, to ensure that we do the early warning mechanisms. The Department of Community Safety participated in the Human Rights Mainstreaming Forum. And for 16 days of activism, they focused on um, femicide, and they are actually mapping the footprint of femicide. It is quite ironic that the 11 murder hotspots in the province are also the 11 GBVF hotspots in the province. And we work very closely with Sarki Bartman Center. Sarki Bartman has established a call center and the number of calls coming in talk to those 11 hotspot areas. So what happens is that in the province we host we have eight hotspots. We host a hotspot meeting on a monthly basis where we talk to the four recovery focus areas. And then, of course, the Department of Community Safety monitors the Victim Empowerment Assistance Program. So if we can turn the slide. Um, the area-based teams I've already touched on, the area-based teams are starting to yield results in that we are now engaging with civil society. We are hosting dialogues with communities. We are identifying activists in communities that within DSD we can bring on board. And our department or my department is in the process of looking at an after hours arrangement where we have a team available to deal with GBVF after hours. Because one of our challenges is that of a very strong unionized workforce that understands and recognizes that at four o'clock the working day ends. And I must say, despite that, we still have many dedicated officials who do work the extra overtime slot, which runs until 10, 10 p.m., after which SAPS has the after hours or the emergency numbers for any intervention that might be required. Chairperson and honorable members, if we go to challenges, it would be remiss of me not to talk to the need to mitigate the social and economic impact of COVID-19 on women in the province and the country. And I used the example of job losses in the ECD sector. Another challenge is the lack of collaboration and the Honorable Deputy Chairperson, Ms. Lucas alluded to that. We have many different platforms and fora, but there is no alignment or there is no synergy and it does seem as if um, gender-based violence, the agenda for GBVF is driven in a piecemeal manner. In our province specifically, gender sensitiv sensitivity training needs to be prioritized for SAPs. And this is not only just for women, but also for persons with disabilities, especially the blind and deaf women who go in to report a case who do not get the necessary and appropriate level of care, dignity, and service when they do report. Within the criminal justice system, I do believe we need to look at gender sensitivity training. We look at the role of maintenance officers at the courts, where we see the economic abuse of women is, is perpetuated. Um, a complainant will come in and be told that um, the respondent can only afford X amount in many cases. And we have a, a keen economic abuse activist, a lady called a Miss Felicity Guest, and she has built up a portfolio of evidence that talks to the fact that economic abuse is happening at a maintenance level at our courthouses then our prison sentences are inconsistent. We see 500 Rand bail and we see 20,000 Rand bail. 
we would see a person uh, char uh, sentenced to 40 years for theft, but for murder, you might get a, a suspended sentence. So we definitely need to work harder to ensure that there's a consistent approach in terms of the legal framework to women and gender, women, men, children, and gender-related issues. We also need to look across provinces at the disproportionate allocation of resources to fight gender-based violence in the different provinces. The Western Cape, sadly, is up top there, and it's nothing that we are proud of. However, the long-term vision of this government is to reduce murders and femicide by 50% over 10 years. It is a stretched target, and we are certainly uh, not seeing any quick wins in this regard. However, I do believe that if we combine our, our energies, if we have um, greater synergy, and uh, we, can, we can start to see the framework, and I do believe that with us having a, a transversal platform now, it feeds into the, the quarterly Premier's Coordinating Forum. We will stay close to the Salga Women's Commission. Within the city of Cape Town, they have a division that focuses solely on GBVF, and they have various programs, Strengthening the Family, Women for Change. We certainly have our work cut out for us going forward. So, Honourable Chairperson and members, in closing, I would like to say that we need to work relentlessly and in a coordinated manner to intensify our efforts to build a more tolerant society, free of gender discrimination, patriarchy, misogyny, and femicide. And it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the Deputy Speaker, Tsunoli. Um, he and I had the privilege of working together for five years when I was the Speaker of the Western Cape Provincial Legislature. And he shared very valuable insights with me regarding the Women's Parliament, the Commonwealth Women's Parliament, and also the multi-party Women's Caucus. So I have certainly learned a lot from him, and I would like to, on this platform, acknowledge him for his contribution to not only enriching my life, but allowing me to share some of those best practices within our province. So in closing, honorable members, we can only achieve gender equity, a world free of violence if we engage all stakeholders in civil society. I am a firm proponent in community asset-based community development. I believe that individuals have agency and that they have the power to co-create a shared future with government and that we should become enablers rather than just telling communities we are going to impose a project or a plan on you. And I do think that if we include civil society as at the center of our discourse, we will, because they play an integral role, we will actually eliminate the scourge of gender-based violence over time. Honorable Chairperson, I would like to request that the presentations that were made, the one that was not presented, if it could be forwarded to ourselves, and I will certainly place this discussion firmly on our next cabinet agenda, which is next Wednesday. And I will also ensure that I do the necessary follow-ups. So should we convene next year, God willing, in a manner like this, I would be able to provide this platform with some significant improvements and possibly come with, with innovation because we are busy mapping, we are creating dashboards, we are plotting hunger, we are plotting the murder scenes, and so we are doing some incredible innovative work. However, it is incremental in the bigger scheme of things. There are little baby steps, but I do believe in closing that the journey of a thousand miles starts 
with that very first step. I thank you, Chairperson. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm tempted to ask as to when is your, your birthday? I respond, it's on the 10th of August, the day after Women's Day. No, thank you very much. <laughs> on a lighter note, I wanted to say now, you did meet with the Department of Water. <laughs> you look nice. Thank you very much for your presentation. Your closing remarks said it all. Indeed, charity begins at home. We are now going to interact with the discussion. Can I, can I get some hands that would like to interact with the, the discussions or the presentation? Thank you. Chairperson, I want to raise my hand, but I don't want to raise it before any other person. Yeah. If there I'm is any other person. <laughs> okay. Unless if they're not going to raise their hand, that's where our uh, the deputy speaker is here. I don't know if there is no one before the deputy speaker. Uh, it's like it's only the two of you. So the deputy speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Um, I regret that I couldn't um, be there throughout because of technology. It happened to me also in the house. Well, not personally, uh, because uh, Zoom uh, just decided to go haywire and we we had to adjourn the house in order to ensure that everybody participates and so on. So this glitches uh, a bit of a headache. I just thought I should say, express my regret. The speaker, uh, I couldn't hear him and uh, he will pardon me that I would have loved to have engaged with what he said at the beginning of today, but I will hear it out later on and I'll give him my feedback. Uh, we. We normally uh, engage whenever we are in forums like this. I just wanted to say that, uh, 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 let me appreciate that uh, these opportunities for interacting together in this way at this level, is not only significant for enable us to, 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 to connect the dots, um, uh, but also to, to develop additional insights, including those that are uh, revealed by the numbers as provided by uh, CGE, as well as uh, FFC and State South Africa in particular, uh, and, and so on. So that's very useful and it helped us make sense of our reality. But what I wanted to say to you uh, all of us here is that uh, firstly, there are implications for oversight. Uh, Madam Deputy Chairperson, I suggest that we must take extraordinary steps so that in the last uh, session, such as this one, I think it's Mpumalanga that we must still have, that we must invite people in the finance uh, area, <clears throat> chairpersons, and, and uh, uh, who are dealing with oversight in the legislative sector, broadly speaking, um, so that uh, what we are saying, uh, including expropriations uh, chairpersons at a national level, so that they are with us as we uh, 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 wrap up, so to speak, the process we have been undertaking all along. And the main reason for that is that we bridge the gap between what we understand needs to be done urgently. The timing is a very interesting one, at least for me, given the work we've been doing to try and raise awareness and lobby for and uh, insist on 
gender sensitivity, and responsiveness in budgeting. So assuming good intent that we invite them, uh, 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 that they are not, they have not been doing it, including uh, those who are in the executive out of malice, but that there are a couple of steps that they need to take to be able to get to grips with the level of awareness. Those of us who have been on this platform uh, for a significant period of time have come to grips with. And the reason is that uh, we are just post budget, post SONA, the State of the Nation address, and provincial uh, addresses, including the budget allocations so far. It might be a very useful exercise that at the beginning of reports uh, uh, from our finance teams, and budget teams in our legislative sector, that we must begin to expose the steps, the baby steps that can be taken now for adjustment. Uh, for example, in October, it might be too close, but it's never too late to begin to propose adjustment for effectiveness. So I suggest that, I suggest that we must be conscious of the opportunity that stares us in the face. The beginning of the budget cycle, uh, uh, following the end of the last one, that there are opportunities there that we should explore so that as we move towards uh, building for the next budget, we have sufficiently raised awareness, insisted on others picking up the gender lens and they incorporate in their calculation and, uh, and ordering of things to this critical national agenda. So that's the one thing that I really want us to, to, uh, to, to, to recognize that opportunity. The second opportunity I see, I'm sure at a municipal level, Salga and its members across the country are beginning uh, to write their uh, legacy reports and to prepare induction program for new councillors. So in the legacy reports, what we write and how it is going to be received is going to be as creative as we can make it so that we are able, this valuable work we've been doing in partnership uh, reaches the next layer of leadership post-2021 in an effective manner. The continuity of this work is increased by the creativity of the legacy report that we leave behind for them to take on. The appropriate changes they will introduce are of necessity uh, the, what democracy is about. But let's build this and recognize it as an opportunity to take forward what we've been doing in the last two years or eight months, uh, yeah, so to speak, uh, so that we, we inform the next steps that must bring to realization. The early guidance for IDPs that was not followed. Uh, uh, in other words, we must ask ourselves, what is it that has prevented uh, people working in these areas not to change? So that when we understand those reasons, we can then take steps to introduce things that must be done to bring about change and significant change. So that's for me uh, the opportunity that I see, the timing that we're in right now. And finally, uh, 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 Chairperson, uh, pardon my indulgence, I'm, I'm inspired also by uh, gender sensitivity in this regard, the way it hit me today, unlike on other days. That the justice peace uh, uh, cluster, if I may call it that, which includes uh, the judicial uh, environment, the prosecutorial environment, the police and correctional services, uh, constitute an important area of work to promote gender sensitivity. So that collaboration 
uh, with actors in this environment must be prioritized in the implementation phase of what emerged in, the, uh, in what we were doing to evaluate uh, women's charter, uh, its review and so on. Concrete things that need to be done, we must take them through. We must find opportunities to take them through into the justice and peace cluster and into the economic cluster, as well as the social cluster and governance clusters. Because those are the four clusters broadly, and um, I hope I'm not leaving out anyone, uh, so that inside these clusters, we have a program uh, project that is aimed at reinforcing uh, building capacity for an awareness for action around gender sensitivity and responsiveness of the entirety of the system. So opportunities that arise in each of these clusters uh, should be expanded and we, we together as a partnership that has been working on these matters becomes the focus of the work that we do. I thought I should raise that, it's a critical one. I've had a very loud um, uh, calls for us to make our economy work 24 hours. There are difficulties, and one of them, I assume, uh, includes the problem of gender-based violence and femicide. And so the necessity for us uh, to create an opportunity for people to work in shifts, if I may put it that way, uh, uh, others, when others are sleeping, others are working, and uh, we accelerate the economic recovery of our country. We can't do that unless conditions for both men and women are free of violence and any such activity that is toxic. So the purpose for us responding to uh, uh, economic recovery must be characterized by agency in carrying out some of these matters here. And I finally agree with the observations that uh, we must intensify work with men's forum, uh, that we must include in our action program for implementing, for implementing the plan, uh, uh, the national strategic plan, uh, with the involvement of uh, community police forums that are organized in the nine provinces and at district level, so that we hear their valuable experience on the ground in dealing with these matters. So their perspectives are very useful and they will improve our appreciation of what's happening in communities by people who are literally in the front line of this campaign against gender-based violence and all other violence in our communities. So let's find a way to creatively engage them and incorporate them in the work that we are doing so that they inform us better. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I hope that uh, the work we are doing to propose additional actions to accelerate uh, 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 non-sexism, which is the goal of our constitution, will bear fruit uh, uh, in, in how we incorporate these ideas we are getting from, from this uh, conversation uh, today. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Thank you very and much. Thank you very much uh, to the, uh, let me say thank you very much to the uh, representative of the premier today, uh, the head of social development in the province. She's right. We've been uh, at this as the speakers forum and I believe that we shared very many insights together, learning from each other's experience. And I really appreciate her uh, uh, even uh, uh, talking about it today. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Uh, hoping that you are not going, <laughs> you, you'll be around because after the Deputy Chairperson, you'll come back again to give the vote of thanks. Deputy Chairperson. Thank, thank you Over very much, the... Chair. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I really appreciate the, the presentation that have been done by our colleague, uh, the 
the MEC for social development. I, I just have a few issues that I specifically want to bring to their atti attention, particularly since we've been having the sessions within the districts. And I, I, I must say that it is, it is actually commendable that there is a, a movement to make sure that we begin to address the issues that is uh, 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 plaguing our communities. Remember, the Western Cape and South Africa in general, but the Western Cape in particular, is experiencing extremely high levels of violence in general, and gender-based violence in particular. So uh, that is why I, I, I want to, to mention the fact that in the, the, the different districts that we, that we address, it is clear that there is an attempt to begin to, 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 to move to address gender programs but unfortunately, they need a lot of assistance. MBC, the, 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 the Western Cape District municipalities that we visited, I cannot now uh, specifically remember the one uh, uh, district, but this person said specifically, we need assistance. We, we want to, but we don't know where to start. And I think <clears throat> you are, particularly with a program that social development is running out, is rolling out, you are very correctly and very uh, 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 good, in a very good position to address that specific issues and to assist the municipalities through SALGA, because we also uh, had the commissioners of SALGA on the platforms, but unfortunately, it is clear that the, the, the problem is, and I, will, I want to be very honest, it is the fact that people don't know where to forget about their differences and to collaborate to ensure that they work in the interest of the community, they work together. We cannot have social cohesion if we still have contestation of, 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 of who is the one that will be able to, to identify better with the, with the, with the communities. Unfortunately, I, I've been saying it on, on public platforms and I'm saying it again, it is unfortunately, it is sad the, the level of polarization that exists at the level of people that are supposed to be delivering services to the people, particularly that, that was our our observation. And I, I and I also I mean you mentioned it yourself and you and that is why I I I I really like this process that we are that we are uh, and that we have rolled out because this process made provinces like your own province, to be very honest with regards to the, to the weaknesses that is, that is existing and very honest to the fact that there is still really a, a, quite a way that we need to traverse to make sure that we begin to address uh, these issues that is, that is there. For instance, that I, what I would want to, to, to advise, also this is an advice, with regards to the issue of safe houses and shelters, make sure that the spread is particularly the issues like you have mentioned, the eight hotspots, and also you have mentioned the 11 hotspots. But the issue is that sometimes the services is not where it is mostly needed. And that is the issue that I, I, I thought that me, let me raise it because I think when we engage at this level, we want to make sure because the, the, the rollout of the Women's Charter Review is 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 multi. It's it's it's, it's a multi. It is a multi purpose. And when I say it's it's a, a multiple purpose, I mean that we want to really listen to women to see how is the 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 consultation in 1994 and the the response of government. How has it really assisted the women in South Africa? But also we want the governments of provinces as well as the districts as well as the local authorities to listen to the issues that women are raising and begin to address it. Like for instance, that is what I'm saying, you, have, you are doing very well in the fact that you are responding with a, 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 a program, a response, a comprehensive nohal for that matter. Like you said, it is, a <coughs> <coughs> sorry, it is, you've got a multi-stakeholder approach and also departments and transversal uh, 
tra transversal issues are being addressed through a, a forum and through uh, social development as a champion of that. So there is there is uh, some areas where we are we are really uh, satisfied that provincial governments are really beginning to look at the issues that we want to look at them to look at, but we will also want provincial legislatures. To, together with Parliament, uh, uh, to make sure that the oversight part of this is being addressed, because in all the provinces that we went to, they really applied their minds. Like yourself, you applied your mind to make sure that there is a response to this process and to the issues that came up through the ordinary people that we engage on the district level. So I agree with with with. With, with the deputy speaker when he say there should be an alignment. And I also agree with the, the, the MEC, like what she have mentioned, there should be an alignment with programs and budgets so that we have a more integrated approach in what we are doing. But I want to actually uh, 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 comment that there is a, in, a, a, a initial process where we begin to see that there is a, a, a movement towards making sure that not only gender-based violence, but also the inequality that is existing within the communities. There is a kind of ad address. And I, in your leadership of this transversal group, just make sure that they also look at other issues like social cohesion, and also the issues of the, the gang-related violence, because in the past few weeks, now it was the children that became the victims of this gang violence that is, that is so uh, prevalent. But I want to say, although uh, it is very much pronounced in the Western Cape, it's not as if it's not happening in other provinces, but what we would want sometimes, we find that, like you said, you started with a, a trauma kind of training, and because it was very effective, it started to become also uh, to be rolled out in other provinces. So what I'm saying is that what is much more pronounced in the Western Cape is the fact that there is for it, it is for decades, it is historically, there is this violent uh, gang, gang related violence. But who is the victims of this gang related violence? is the women and the children. That is why we are not only speaking about domestic violence, we are speaking about violence in general, but also the issue that the transversal group can address the issues of social cohesion and coordination and reconciling of programs. And when I'm saying coordination and reconciling of programs, I want to specifically also respond to, or not respond, but to add on the issue of then the, the budgets can actually be be, uh, be, uh, be, uh, be used more in a more coordinated way to address the issues. And I think the, the report from the, the Commission on Gender Equality will be, you, you will receive it and you will see that there is a, a res, a recommendations like the recommendations of the Finance and Fiscal Com Commission. The Finance and Fiscal Commission was, have been consistent were the recommendations that they are making for all provinces. But the, fortunately, with the Commission on Gender Equality, we could have province-specific information that is actually addressing the issues. And also in your report, if we can really have a kind of a specific report that, that show where the shelters are and where there is still a need for shelters, where are you collaborating with national to address specifically, particularly in your rural areas, where there is sometimes a lack of understanding or a lack of coordination of programs with regards to this to these issues. So I, I don't think uh, it is a question, but it is some of the recommendations that we want to make and we want the, the provincial government to begin to respond to that specifically. Thank you very much, Chairperson. That is me and that is my contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP, Ms. Lucas. And thank you very much to the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Sinoling. 
for awarding me this opportunity to lead you or to direct the high level session. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to anyone, everybody who is in this platform. We're now getting to the last item in our, in today's session, which is vote of thanks. I will call upon the Deputy Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Tzoli Tzinoli, to give or to pass the message of vote of thanks. Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Kate Bilankulu. Uh, we, uh, we start with you and the leadership you have uh, uh, done on our behalf today, facilitating uh, the dialogue that has taken place. Thank you very much. Uh, we also must thank the deputy chair and work with us collaboratively uh, to in this major task of cooperating and collaborating with districts and provinces uh, in the work uh, we are doing to advance uh, the interests of those who conceived of a guiding uh, way in the name of a uh, women's charter in a very difficult context. Uh, let me also say thank you very much to the speaker. Masizole, Siabonga, Mfo, Ngogus Patagakle, Kasuk Bagache. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The speakers forum will convene soon and we will meet once more properly. Uh, we appreciate your, your welcoming remarks, even if unfortunately I didn't hear them. I knew there was no way they wouldn't be but welcoming. So, and we appreciate that. Uh, the, the, uh, of course, I have to appreciate the, the input and the overall presentation. Uh, in the area in which uh, it so happens falls under her responsibility of social development, Honorable Shana Fernandez. Uh, it's been very interesting uh, and useful insights that we get from the work you are doing as a province and you individually, the initiatives you have undertaken. Uh, there is no question that, um, as I said earlier on, that without our partnerships, with State South Africa solely, uh, you have been an accompaniment uh, with us. You have become part of the family. And uh, the, the, as I said earlier, the, the, the insights, numbers expose and produce for our recognition so that we understand our reality better is absolutely valuable exercise in the work we are doing. And so is the work uh, that was constitutionally uh, called for uh, to and to be led by the Commission for Gender Equality. Uh, Honorable Ntabise Moliko and her extremely uh, valuable insight uh, and the research they conduct and the valuable lessons they have been learning. Uh, it's been very useful uh, in uh, the collaboration that we have had. Let me include, uh, uh, I called her my uh, home girl, uh, uh, now, I don't know what people accept being called home girls when they are adults, uh, but I do it because I know her well. And uh, uh, herself, having joined the commission, and uh, Nomonde, who has been a stable pillar of support for the work we've been doing from the beginning, uh, it's been very uh, absolutely uh, exciting uh, to hear the insights of the Finance and Fiscal Commission, uh, that uh, those of us who have been long enough and are familiar with the work of the FFC, uh, we may not always have had a public uh, engagement together, such as this opportunity for reviewing the Women's Charter gave us. So I really appreciate uh, the quality and the kind of research you've conducted and uh, the insights you are sharing with us to sharpen our ability to be responsive to people's demands inside municipalities, provinces, and nation. And so thank you very much for your valuable contribution. Uh, your institutions are critical pillars 
of our democracy. When we beat our chests, that uh, there are some, there's one or two things we've done well. It includes the work you have been doing uh, on our behalf uh, uh, of, of governance. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I think it is now uh, handing back to you, uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, thank you once more. And of course, the staff of Parliament who are with us and have been with us, uh, we thank them profusely. And we hope they, they leave no single insight unrecorded uh, for our benefit. So uh, uh, we thank them in advance uh, as we put together and think about and evaluate this work. Uh, they will be playing an important role in reminding us uh, uh, what insights emerge that we may uh, not have noticed or may not sufficiently have recognized. So we thank them for that. Thank you very much and uh, have a great weekend. Uh, let's hope the difficulties that we are confronted with, uh, we are able to cope and deal with them effectively over time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Honorable Wilangulu. Can you just adjourn the session? <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very long day. Eh, eh. It was really a long day, but it was fruitful and it was necessary. Thank you very much, Joe, particularly also for your support. Throughout the day, it was so good with the multi-party women's caucus program. And also now, and our partner, the deputy speaker, was extremely well in the in the in the interview that he had about our our focus on GBV and other things, we really want to express our appreciation. I think Parliament is moving in in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Western Cape particularly, and uh, we 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 just want to make sure that we do work all together because we've got a common uh, view and a common objective. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank us. Enjoy uh, your weekend. Thank us as well, Chairperson. Uh, they do a wonderful work uh, for all of us. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Particularly our staff. Without them, we would have been nowhere. Thank you very much. Yeah. Once again, thank you. And we will see each other still with the last event of Pumalanga. And after that, we will have a farewell party when we sit down to discuss the findings. Thank well, you. Thank you for such <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> thank you very everyone. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I wish to see that last part. Thank <laughs> 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 you. Sure. We work very hard. Yeah. <laughs> An African say on the arbiter of say loan vert. Thank you, one. Bye, Ranky. Thank you. Uh, I know Thank Kate is in trouble right. now when you speak African. She's in trouble. Yeah, she's... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, bye. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye.